Uh, we welcome you on behalf of United Tribes and on behalf of my office. Um, and uh, we're pleased that you're here uh, and that you bring with you uh, some good ideas ab about the issue of what is memorialization. Uh, and I've always felt that we need to do a bit more about what that is and what happened here at Fort Lincoln in particular, but of course what it represented and represents across the nation and for all Americans. Uh, yeah. You know, I uh, oftentimes think of that in the context of Native Americans and American Indians because we had a number of marches throughout this continent ourselves uh, that predate the existence of the United States of America. And my issue there is not one of a browbeating or of attempting to uh, talk about low the poor American Indian, but rather talk about the issues of what is important when we talk about democracy and the making of democracy. Century. And we're still hard at that yet, despite the issues of sometimes poverty, despite the issues of fighting for our tribal rights with, with and for and against the United States government at various times, with and for and against sometimes the various states of the Union. So we are engaged yet in that building of what we consider a tribal America. There are some particular issues of the kind of people that were held here, oftentimes I think relegated to the fact or to the idea of that fact in that era that said these were unpatriotic people. These were people who didn't care about America and who were re ready to renounce it. You know, I come from a tribe of people called the Hunkpapa Lakota, one of the greatest, we feel, in the nation, a fellow by the name of Sitting Bull. And he was accused of renouncing, and he would fit very well into this category of renunciates, because he refused to accept America, if you want to call it that, at that time, on its terms of conditions, and said, if I'm going to accept an America, it will be on my terms and conditions. He died for that value, by the way, unfairly, unjustly, in my view. But the telling of that story and your story is so critical and so important. It needs to be heard. It needs to be told. It needs to be said in the way that you think is appropriate to the facts that are there. And if it is not allowed to be told, then we do not live in a democracy. That's our view of it. This story fits so well. And the truth of the story needs to be told, as I said, because there are those who still don't understand it. And there are those, and there are some, who will not accept the story. You and I know that, just as I talked about Sitting Bull or other kinds of leaders. But we must tell that story. I don't know what all the ideas will be that you have. Uh, some of you already have good ideas, I know, uh, because there are some strong thinkers in the room. I can feel it, for one thing. <laughs> and. And so I don't need to participate and say, here's what I think should happen. But we're very open to what we think can happen, how it should be told, and what needs to uh, take place in terms of the steps to come. Uh, and we will do what we can to help out, along with other sponsors and others uh, in this community and throughout the United States in making these kinds of things happen. But the history of America, as you well know, is not just one single story. It is not just the pilgrim's pride, you know, uh, and that sort of thing. It is about all kinds of things. America, and we intend to make it our part of America. That ought to be, I would hope, your spirit in terms of what you put together. Let us make the America we want that is our America. And we will participate then fully and completely. So I wish you well in your work in the pat next uh, several days. And more to come, I, 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 would, I would think. A lot more to come. So, Pilama, Pilamielo, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to let you sit here because you're sitting on top of what was once the swimming pool <laughs> of the U.S. military here, by the way. So, and it's still down below us, by the way. We didn't, we didn't destroy it. We just covered it with sand and put concrete over it. And who knows, maybe someday we'll unearth it and we'll use it again, you know. <laughs> Because we Indians are used to using things as we need to, you know. <laughs> thank you very much. Pilama, Pilama, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> there were many terms that Dr. Gipp used that I think are great um, benchmarks for us as we work through this. That the idea of the life force 
that can come from a memorial, that we want something that will inspire uh, and educate <coughs> and um, uh, restore some of the dignity that was lost as a result of the imprisonment of the German Americans and the Japanese Americans here. Um, the other part of the story that I think is really important is uh, that we as a people were brought together just like the Native Americans that Dr. Gipp talked about uh, by force. Uh, the German uh, uh, so-called enemy aliens, the Japanese so-called enemy aliens were brought together on this uh, property against our wishes and uh, here we are now hoping to work together with the Native American folks to uh, tell our stories together. Now I have to tell you that um, when Karen and I started working, um, I knew a lot more about the Japanese American experience and not much about the German American experience. And in my head, I think I did what many people did and it was a great lesson for me that Karen taught me about. The idea that, okay, but the German Americans were really enemy aliens. You know, it was legal that they were held prisoner. Whereas the Japanese Americans had been American citizens who uh, under coercion and pressure renounced their American citizenship and then as a result of that were, were called enemy aliens and were then um, removed from the WRA camps and brought into <coughs> Department of Justice prison camps. Now, Karen pointed out to me that what's legal depends on your perspective. And uh, what I've learned through our work together is how important it is that we tell all the story here, that we work together and create some kind of commemoration of the suffering and losses that all of our people suffered and uh, use that as an educational and an inspirational piece. So um, well, I'm not going to say very much except I just want to um, thank United Tribes so much for having us here and for being so welcoming uh, just time and time again. I'm overwhelmed by the generosity of spirit that I feel here and, and uh, the ties that somehow my father felt to this place even when he was interned and was out on the plains working on the railroad just seems to go on and on and on and uh, I don't think he truly was at peace with what had happened to him till he came back here when we were here in 2003 and went through the ceremony that you mentioned. And in fact, um, unfortunately, my, my father passed away in 2007 and we retained our ties so much from the time that we were here in 2003 that they actually did a sing for at the time of his uh, funeral here out on Standing Rock through the Thunderhawk family. So it just, you know, we have really close ties here. I love this place. So anyway, and, and I really appreciate you being willing to let us have a memorial here. I mean, this is your campus. This is your place. And, and uh, we really appreciate you um, having us here. So. I want to tell you two quick stories that I hope will remind us all why we're here. Wolfgang Thomas was born in Hamburg, Germany in 1904. In his youth, he was sickly and frail. In the 1930s, he had started a family and was a successful businessman in Hamburg but he and his wife decided to leave behind the soot and industrial grime of Hamburg and come to America for good health. He eventually settled in Seattle where he was a successful importer. He built a new home on a promontory in Seattle overlooking Puget Sound. The home was the realization of his dreams. But in 1940, the FBI office in Seattle received a letter from an anonymous informant. I believe, the informant said, that Wolfgang Thomas is connected with the German government. Based on that single anonymous informant, J. Edgar Hoover 
directed the Seattle FBI office to investigate Thomas as a subject for possible custodial detention in the event of war with Germany. And in the summer of 1941, FBI agents from the Seattle office came to Thomas's new home. During the interview, who to he told the agents that he was personally opposed to Hitler's form of government because, he said, you could not do as you wished. In the eventual report sent by the Seattle FBI office to Hoover, the agents wrote, inasmuch as no information has been developed concerning espionage activity, the case of Wolfgang Thomas is being closed. Despite the recommendation of his own FBI office, Thomas was classified by Hoover as an enemy alien, and he did not remove Thomas's name from the custodial detention list. And on the evening of December 9, 1941, FBI agents entered his new home in, in uh, Seattle above Puget Sound. They searched it, they confiscated all his books, and then he was arrested as an enemy alien. Thomas was among the first 110 West Coast German enemy aliens who arrived by train at Fort Lincoln on December 20th, 1941. In February of 1942, Thomas appeared for a 10-minute hearing before the Alien Enemy Hearing Board convened on the first floor of the headquarters building. Wasn't his home, the board asked, the perfect vantage point for spying on military shipping? Where had he gotten the money to build the new home? He was a successful importer, he explained. He had saved his own money to buy the home. Since his arrival in America, he had abided by all American laws. A week later, relying upon the recommendation of the hearing board, Attorney General Francis Biddle issued an order for the internment of Wolfgang Thomas as a potentially dangerous enemy alien. Thomas immediately sent a letter to Biddle I ask you to kindly reconsider and give me an opportunity to <coughs> prove to you my loyalty to this country. Biddle did not answer Thomas's letter, and Thomas's bitterness ate at him. The sickliness he had experienced as a boy in Germany returned. He suffered chronic gastric ulcers. His gallbladder began acting up. He was unable to sleep or eat. In the fall of 1942, Thomas was transferred to Army internment facilities in Stringtown, Oklahoma. At Stringtown, he was hospitalized for bleeding ulcers. As a dubious cure, the Stringtown doctors re recommended the removal of all his teeth. In early of 1943, Thomas returned to Fort Lincoln. After nearly two years of internment, he was finally paroled from Fort Lincoln in June of 1943. He had lost his import business. His health had suffered. And at almost 40 years old, he found himself starting life in America all over again. In late January of 1942, San Francisco resident Isao Ito had been admitted into the United States as a treaty merchant, able to conduct his business affairs but not acquire citizenship. Because he had served two years in the 1930s as a draftee in the Japanese Army in San Francisco, in February of 1942, he was arrested by the FBI and sent by prison train to Fort Lincoln. While here, he had to interview, he had to act as an interpreter, and he had to intervene 
for the Japanese aliens who were being physically abused by INS agents because angry Korean interpreters were delivering false and offensive interpretations during the alien hearings. From Fort Lincoln, Ito was transferred to the Army's Camp Livingston in Louisiana, where he spent a year in the same compound with Japanese POWs. Ito was next sent to the INS internment facility in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and finally to Crystal City, Texas. He had spent over four years in internment in four different barbed wire compounds. When he returned to San Francisco, his youngest son, now six years old, only wanted to know, who are you? The sad stories of Wolfgang Thomas and Isao Ito are but two of thousands of similar stories from World War II. Some of you in this room lived those same sad stories. Most of you also know the details of the so-called Alien Enemy Control Program. You know how fear, ethnic prejudice, and racism drove the program. And you know the numbers as well as I do. 15,000 Japanese, 11,000 Germans, and 3,000 Italians were arrested, detained, and interned as enemy aliens. Tens of thousands more from the three communities were affected by the restrictions and provisions of the Alien Enemies Act. But the danger is that in knowing only that comprehensive history, we will forget the poignant stories of thousands of internees like Isao Ito and Wolfgang Thomas who had their lives shattered. So why are we here? We are here to plan a proper memorial installation for those internees, not just those who were here at Fort Lincoln, but nearly 50 other camps throughout the United States. We are here to plan for a memorial that will warn us against <laughs> ever again becoming a nation so gripped by fear and ethnic prejudice and racism that we create a dragnet of suspicion about sabotage and espionage that covers one million aliens. In World War II, that dragnet eventually swept up. An importer from Seattle who only wanted an opportunity to prove my loyalty to this country. That same dragnet also swept up a harmless Japanese alien from San Francisco whose own son did not recognize him when he finally came home from internment. We have a lot of important work to do in the next two days, and I hope you're looking forward to it as much as I am. Many of the immigrants, of course, who went west from New York City after landing in the shadow of uh, Lady Liberty, came across this area in a train and headed either to the Midwest or the West or other places in the United States. My family, my dad and his siblings and his mom and dad took that trip by train. They started out in New York and they ended up in Washington, in the Palouse country of Washington. That was in 1923, and my dad was 17 years old. That train took him to a new life in the United States. He loved being an American. He was uh, very, very attached to the land that he ended up inheriting. Uh, even though it was kind of a run-down, dilapidated farm, a lot of debt on it. He and his family got to work, fixed up the fences, fixed up the buildings, started paying off the debt on the land. And so 
He was part of this country. He had eventually started his citizenship process, um, wanted to be a citizen. Now there was another train uh, that was prominent in my father's life. That train started out, I think, probably in Los Angeles area. That train traveled uh, toward the end of December. It had barred windows and some of the windows were blacked out. There was a machine gun mounted in the back of each car. That train was a sad train. And it picked up men all over the West. And then that train eventually made its way to Spokane, Washington, where my dad was waiting in the Spokane County Jail. After a visit by the FBI on December 9th, 1941, excuse me. He was taken from the farm, taken from his hysterical family. My mother was crying hysterically. My brother was shouting at the FBI man, you bad man, he was four years old. And my mother asking through tears, where are you taking my husband and why are you doing this? And she was told it's really none of your business. That resonates with me 60 some years later. It's really none of your business. Uh, you all know that, I know that. 90, 99%, 99.99% of the people picked up by the FBI during those times in December and later in 1942 and 43, were absolutely innocent. And it's hard, it's hard for a lot of other citizens of the United States to accept that fact. You've probably had the same experience that I've had when, and when telling the story of my dad, somebody usually said, oh, he must have done something. He must have done something to deserve this. And I think that's why our work here is so important, is because we need to show the others in the United States, the citizens of our proud country, that, that we have some improvement to do, that we have some work to do. We have some, some important work to do to tell people the story of where we went wrong in history and how we don't want to go wrong again in the same way. Seven members of my family were brought up from Costa Rica in 1943. My parents, my mother was an American citizen, my father a German citizen, uh, Werner and Starr. My sister Ingrid, who was a, a baby, uh, my aunt, my tia, Pani, who was a Costa Rican by birth, my cousin, Ermida, also Costa Rican by birth, and my uncle, Carl Oscar. We called him Oki. So uh, in World War II, my father was labeled one of 35 most dangerous enemy aliens in Costa Rica by a man who was later labeled, uh, he was a military attache, who was later labeled one of the least reliable agents in Latin America. Um, I, well, I like that, of course, on a personal level, because it means that my father really probably wasn't that dangerous. Um, this gentleman was unable to speak Spanish, German, or Japanese. He relied on paid informers. In 1942, my father and my uncle were thrown into a dirty, vermin-filled, overcrowded prison. My mother, a United States citizen who was born and raised in California, wrote to her brother, since day before yesterday, Werner has been in the local penitentiary. We haven't the remotest idea why they arrested him or what's going to happen to him and the many others there. And they won't let me see anyone to find out the charges against him or to do any explaining. Heidi wakes up at night screaming, Poppy, Poppy. And today is Ingrid's first birthday. As you see, my heart is breaking. My father also wrote desperately to the United States officials. 
In a last effort to resolve the situation of my family, I, Werner Gorka, now interned in the concentration camp in San Jose, Costa Rica, sincerely ask to consider the following points. There does not exist a real motive for my internment otherwise than that I am German. Even if you do think otherwise, there must be a mistake, and I'm sure to convince you to it if you will only have the kindness to present to me the reasons. But there wasn't a response. There were no hearings, no legal procedures, no recourse of any kind. In January of 1943, we were loaded onto the United States Army Transport, the Puebla, for deportation to the United States. We sailed on the 26th after a week in port under blackout conditions and arrived in San Pedro, California on the 6th of February. There, even though the, many, many of us were sick, there was no medical attention or very minimal medical attention. The whole goal of a hearing that was held there was to prove that we had entered the country illegally. All visas, all passports had been confiscated on board. We were given baggage tags to fit to, fit, to tie to our clothes. Over a year and a half after my father had first been ar arrested, he was finally given a legitimate hearing in January of 1944. We were released from Crystal City that May and allowed to go to a beach house that my mother family had in uh, Santa, uh, Santa Cruz, California. My uncle and his family chose to go to Germany. Um, my uncle was concerned about his mother and father who had been bombed out in the Hamburg bombings. And, um, and also I think he just couldn't bear the thought of being behind bars for an indefinite period of time. In 1946, my father was declared no longer an alien enemy, but the very same day he got that letter, immigration officials knocked at the door and handed him an arrest warrant because he had entered the country illegally. <laughs> that took another two years to straighten out, and I think, um, I mean, there were a number of factors that made us be able to stay in the United States, but one of them, I think, was 18 neighbors who got together and wrote an impassioned uh, petition to the State Department saying that my father was no risk, that he was a cultured, sensitive family man, and that he was a great asset to the community. So I have always been grateful to those neighbors who had the courage to sign their names in a time like that. My father um, became a citizen in 1952. He became a citizen of the United States, but not without trepidation. He had always loved Costa Rica. He finally, in 1954, they were able to scrape together enough money for him to go back and, and see. Um, he realized when he was there that Costa Rica was no longer the heart of his, you know, his life, that where his family was was home. And so his last years, I think, were contented years. Um, but he spent almost a decade with uncertainty and fear, as did my mother. My father was barely 61 when he died of lung cancer, I think ex exacerbated at least by the chain smoking that he developed while he was in the Huskau in, in Costa Rica. My mother, um, my father never talked about it. He did save all his records quietly in a filing cabinet, which I found after his death. My mother, I got her to sit down and talk about it, but she cried. It took me a month of visits, and especially around the deportation when we had been so sick, she could barely get a word out before, before the tears would just flow. So anyone that tells you there aren't scars is lying. <laughs> Our suffering, our pain, our loss of civil rights has never been acknowledged by Congress. Most Americans don't know our story, especially the German and the German Latin American. We're being written out of history. So I look forward to working with all of you to plan a memorial that recognizes both Fort Lincoln's unique history, but also the common experiences that we as former alien internees all share, whatever our ethnicity and wherever our prison. Thank you. I want to thank Saskia actually for inviting me over here. Um, she had also kindly extended a, an invitation to Charlie Hamasaki, who is 90, and he just said he physically
can make it from Los Angeles, but he is um, the one of the probably the only surviving Japanese who was here in the first group. I know everybody here was in the second group. Um, he's a an immigrant. Um, he's actually culturally very Americanized. He's almost like a he's a Nisei basically culturally uh, American born. Uh, but his mother was pregnant with him in Japan, so uh, and she had to extend her stay there because his brother got measles. So that's why he was born in Japan, but was only there for three months. He grew up in Terminal Island, which is a very tight uh, fishing community in San Pedro in Southern California. And so um, right after Pearl Harbor, December 7th, the first group of uh, Japanese fishermen were picked up by the FBI, and he remembers that. He was picked up in uh, February 1942. And the reason why they knew he was born in Japan is because when you get a fishing license, you have to say that you were, where were you born? And he put Japan, which in retrospect, he thought, gee, he should have just bullshitted them. <laughs> that's, that's his words. Um, they were interrogated for four days at the Terminal Island uh, Immigration Center. And they, after that, they were brought, they were put on a bus, and they could see all the wives, and, and he saw his mother, and they were all crying, and, and his mom like yelled at him, where are you going? And he said, I don't know. Um, he was there with his father. So he was probably the only father's son from Terminal Island to be picked up. And they were not told where they were being, no, where they were gonna go and they were brought to Union Station in Los Angeles and by train, like everybody else was talking about, they were put on a blacked out train and they had guards and they were um, shipped to who knows where. Uh, Charlie says that some of the conversation on the train was, uh, some of the East States would say, you know, they were, they'd give you a meal and they said, well, shinu kakugo de yarinasai, it's like, do it or eat it like you're gonna die. You know, that's, that was kind of the sentiment. There was a lot of anger. Um, there's talk about, you know, democracy, but some of the Japanese are talking about there's no democracy here. They call it democracy shit. <laughs> and um, so that was the attitude on the train and they had no idea where they were going. Uh, they got here in February, so it was freezing and they were not allowed to pack a suitcase. So when the FBI came to get Charlie, they told him to have nice shoes, good heavy shoes, and a jacket. So that's all they had when they got here. Later on, they were given clothes. And he said for about the uh, first three or four months, they had to, every morning, go outside, line up, and there would be a head count. So everybody was shivering out there, you know, while the guards with guns would count their heads. But I, he said after three or four months, they realized that they were not a threat. So they got friendly with the guards and um, they stopped doing the head counts. Um, the early years here, he doesn't remember what he ate, but they said the food was terrible. So they uh, complained to the Spanish consul, which under the Gene Geneva Convention, the Spain was a neutral country. So they interceded and actually he said after that the food got better. Um, he remembers the Germans played a lot of soccer and they did uh, sumo and baseball. And they didn't compete with the Germans because the fishermen were a little older than the younger Germans so they couldn't compete against them. Uh, and then they gambled, they did a lot of gambling uh, they had this thing about going every day, they would um, sing a song. And the, these are Japanese immigrants, so they all sang like Japanese songs, Shiging or Naniwabushi, but Charlie didn't know any of this, so he'd sing God Bless America. <laughs> but you know, the Issei didn't know what he was singing. Uh, Charlie was released in August 1942. Uh, released but sent to Santa Anita Assembly Center where the rest of his family was. Oh, and then his father was released from Bismarck a few months later and the family was reunited uh, and then they all went to Jerome. So that's Charlie's story, so I just wanted to share that 
since there's no one from the first group here, um, Satsuki actually asked me to introduce Bill Nishimura. Bill is also from Los Angeles. Uh, he uh, and his family decided to be, there was a period where the government gave like a one week period where you could, Japanese Americans could move out of the Western military zone in California so that they could try to avoid going to camp. So Bill moved to Central California, but shortly that area became a military zone to exclude Japanese Americans also. So he actually ended up going to post it uh, Arizona, Camp 3. Uh, he is not a no-no. He did not answer question 27 and 28. No, <coughs> excuse me. No, no. He refused to answer question 28. Is that correct, Bill? You refused to answer question 28. Yes, right. And um, that's why they just put him down as a no-no, and he ended up at uh, Tule Lake Segregation Center, and then Santa Fe Department of Justice Camp, and then Crystal City. So that is the story. And I guess we're gonna have Bill come. Well, we had it in the mess hall. The test was in the mess hall. And the, uh, we had 30 something uh, questions. And it was all simple, you know, your name, address, and all that. And, and all of a sudden, when I came to 27 and 28, I had to stop and read it over and over again. I said, what kind of a question is this? I learned all the Constitution of the United States of America in a public school. And why should they ask me again to reaffirm my loyalty? That's a dumb question, I felt. And so I was almost at the last person to leave the mess hall, and I just couldn't answer that question, so I said, when my civil rights is restored, I will answer it. And I handed the paper to them. And the people who answered no, no, were soon transferred to disloyal camp in Tule Lake. However, I was left behind because of incomplete questionnaire. <laughs> then, oh, maybe about three, four, five months later, my dad, who was appre apprehended by the FBI soon after Pearl Harbor, showed up at the camp. Oh, we were startled when, of course, very much happy, and <clears throat> then uh, after about three weeks, uh, after my dad came home, this administration called me and said, appear at my office at a certain time. Mm -hmm. So I appeared at the office, and the first thing this uh, uh, camp manager asked me, uh, said, was, uh, how do you feel that your dad is back? I said, of course, I'm very, we're very happy and very thankful for the United States of America for releasing him to the family. And now that your dad is back, how do you feel about your questionnaires? So I said, you have not restored my civil rights. So my answer is the same. I'm not answering those questions. Oh man, the manager, the camp manager got so angry and he, he said, does this mean that uh, your answer is no? So I said, it's up to you to make the decision, not me. And then a few weeks later, I was transferred to Tully Lake. And <clears throat> at that time, my dad didn't want to go to Tully Lake. He wanted to stay with the family and the grandkids. And so we asked, and they said, your dad's release from Santa Fe is incomplete. He isn't a free person. 
And you can tell that they in rush to get my answer, to change my mind, they did that. And so he wasn't a free person. So he was denied, you know, <clears throat> to stay at Top Poston. So he joined me at Tule Lake. Uh, while in Tule Lake, another program came up. And this was either you renounce or you stay as is, which meant you are in a disloyal camp without civil rights, and we will see that you are a loyal citizen. And if you don't like that, you must renounce. Now, to this point, I was fighting for my civil rights. And which, if I uh, renounce, naturally I'll just throw away what I was planning to do. And then the way the government stated that we will uh, <clears throat> uh, see that you are a loyal citizen as is, which meant without civil rights. And that didn't mean anything either. And I debated. And I came to a conclusion that this isn't the country that I believed in. And so I renounced my citizenship. And it was the government who blatantly violated the Constitution. And they act, and to me, they acted illegally. So, what I'm doing now is to tell the government, no, no, I think I'm telling the government, you are wrong. So in my mature mind, and that was my feeling. So, uh, all of us were the same ideal. We again ask the question, then if you're going to confront the government, are you willing to renounce your citizenship? And that was my confrontation with the government as an American citizen is one thing. To renounce your citizenship is another issue. So we thought about it, I thought about it. But the situation that my family and I was in was my, my parents had already decided that after 40 years of hard labor and sun saving, and there was all white time. And so they decided, maybe even in the age, my father was almost 50 years old. In, in his age, he says, maybe we do have a little better chance going to Japan to restart our life. And he was fortunate that he was uh, an eldest in his family and he had some inheritance. So. Uh, my family already decided firmly we, uh, the family is going back to Japan and start the life again. And I was at the crossroad. Should I keep my citizenship, not renouncing it? But there is a strong possibility that I would separate my, from my family forever. Or should I renounce and stay with my family, go to Japan, and together fight the, the uh, livelihood, try to make a living in Japan. So in that milieu, I decided I would stay with my family because that was the only thing I had left in my family, 
in my life. Government has discarded me. My family has stayed with me. So uh, I uh, decided to renounce. Soon thereafter, all of us of a light thinking and light idea, similar idea, worship to so-called enemy internment camp in Fort Lincoln. And when we arrived, we talked to ourselves. Hey, we finally we got to be an enemy alien without a country. Uh, it's an honor for me to uh, introduce Junichi Yamamoto. Uh, and just a short story. Um, his son took my class, I think somewhere around 1971 or 72, one of the first Asian American courses at Sac State. And his, when we got to the World War II part, he said, you know, my dad was at Bismarck. And what that told me was that Junichi talked with his children about his experience at Bismarck. And I knew that there were other Japanese who did other things besides go off to the concentration camps. There were people who stood up for their principles. So very early on, I knew that the traditional history was missing a few paragraphs. And so we've been, over the decades, trying to fill in those paragraphs. And um, I've known Junichi for decades. And uh, you know he's a man of few words, but when he speaks, people listen. So. Um, he's well respected in the Japanese community as one of our elders. So um, with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Yamamoto. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, Wayne was my uh, son's friend, and in fact, he was the uh, best man at my son's wedding. Uh, I was asked by uh, Dr. Ina to say a, a few words, and uh, I just prepared a short uh, note here, and my grandson, grandson typed it out for me the other day. So, I'll make it real short. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Gitt and uh, staff of the United Tribes Technical College and also Dr. Satsuki Ina and her staff for inviting us to return this memorable place where we were interned 65 years ago. Uh, you have to ex excuse my English because, like I said, I was born here, but raised and educated in Japan. So you have to excuse my uh, English language. It was, uh, this was so long ago, you know, and uh, being 90 year old, you, you forget a lot of things. Uh, things are disappearing. And uh, we, although we experience many hardship and injustices, I can still recall some of the half year and with warm memories of friendship and good times we had here in Bismarck. I still remember uh, the warm welcoming party they had for us from the German people. And uh, we were pleasantly surprised when welcoming speech was made in Japanese. <laughs> and we were, we quickly searched for uh, uh, our group that spoke uh, German 
and uh, we were fortunate to find one young man that uh, made our uh, appreciations, appreciation speech in German. I think he did pretty good. <laughs> and also we had a swimming meet over here and uh, it happened, uh, it was mentioned last night from uh, Mr. Newman that this, this was a, a swimming pool before. And uh, we had a, a swimming meet between German people and Japanese. And I was one of the swimmer. And the first place winner. <laughs> I have a certificate outside uh, that uh, it shows that uh, I was one of the swimmer and uh, uh, I was one of the winner. <laughs> These are uh, some of the happy memories I had here in Bismarck, and I want to thank again this, uh, Dr. Ina for inviting me and my grandson to come here. I am honored and glad to participate in this memorial planning project. I think Fort Lincoln, Bismarck, North Dakota is a, in, in a unique city and place which includes the uh, Native Americans that are for, or have been forgotten. And I think our memorial here will bring that out and uh, that we are covering more than just the Japanese and the Germans and the Italian incarceration. And I'm proud to be here and I think that the people are here are proud to do something that's different from other camps in the memorial. Thank you. I just wanted to say how overwhelming it's been to be the guest of the United Tribes um, and that it took a group that has suffered, that Native Americans have suffered for generations and centuries and endured so much pain at the hands of the U.S. government. And it was this group that recognized the pain suffered by the German Americans and um, Italian Americans, and um, of course, my my interest is that the Japanese Americans. But that this is a group that acknowledged and honored the story of the Renunciants, a group of people that has been written out of Japanese American history, and um, that it's so extraordinary that that. Uh, Native Americans were the ones that had the understanding and the compassion and the generosity to help us tell the story. So thank you. Well, this is what our group decided, and we felt that there weren't just three things. There was there were six, and. Obviously, the greatest part of the story on a national basis for our people is why was due process denied and how do we let ourselves do that in times of stress. We felt that the scale of the internment is incredibly important because that's part of what, it's part of what amazes you when you, when you learn about it, how huge it was. Uh, we talked about the role of the FBI's um, flawed investigation, how this highly vaunted agency of the time really did poor investigations. They, there was no real uh, gathering of evidence or testing of that evidence as there should be. And then, of course, at the, at the personal level, this is what brings it down to all of our families. It's all of our stories. And that's part of what brings people into it to the people that aren't us, because that's going to be part of what we've got to do. Um, we also feel that the multicultural alliance that, that we have here is very important because it brings people together who uh, 
as we all do, we tend to think of ourselves first. And when we, when we realize what other people, because of who they were, went through, and then realize it happened to us too, it could happen to you, not one of those groups. So how do you, how do you, how do you show that the Constitution is not just for the good and easy times, it's for the stressful hard times? How do we do that? So how do we accomplish this? Um, we think that we have to look at this in terms of a multiple grant process, exploring matching funds from various sources. And part of that means bringing other groups into our group because they can benefit from this too. So it's, it's kind of the idea of uh, how can we leave this room and contact other people who are not as impassioned on this, but could be if we, if we told it to them properly. Um, we do feel that uh, so at some point there has to be provisions for administrative funding. This is very difficult, I'm sure, for, for the people that organize this. How do, how do we get funding for uh, people who are going to do this almost as a job? There has to be an organized PR campaign. And we feel at Fort Lincoln, we have to come up with virtual tours, possibly a building, and compensation for archivists and, uh, and, and research. Now, what would this building be? Recreate an interior as much as possible from the descriptions of former internees. Uh, incorporate original sign somehow. Yeah, we talked about possibly renovating the, the iron um, arch that's back over here in the trees. Um, possibly a list of internees. And that list could grow because how do you find all of the people? I'm not sure we can. Uh, a little redundant on-site <coughs> archivist, document, ar document the archives, preservation and display of memorabilia, that's it. Uh, I think overall that we had two general uh, desires and we talked a great deal about the memorial having an educational aspect primarily and I'll get into some detail about that. The other thing that we wanted overall was that the memorial would have an impact. Um, I remember that one of the questions we asked each other is, what memorials have you visited that you remember most vividly? And the only one that I can remember that several people immediately mentioned was the Holocaust Museum in Washington. So we, we talked a bit about that and why that museum had made such an impression on us. So I guess the upshot of that is that we want to have something that will stick in people's minds when they've been here, when they've participated in the memorial, that they'll take home with them, that they'll, they'll tell other people about, that will be something they won't forget. Okay, so with those general ideas in mind, then we also broke it down into what I would call two different approaches. And let's call the first one the themes that we wanted to have conveyed in the memorial. Themes, ideas, you can pick your word. The first one that immediately came up amongst all of us, almost unanimously, was we wanted to make certain that everybody was impressed by the atmosphere of fear in the country. Fear drove everything. It drove the population, it drove the government, and it in fact drove the people who were subjects of all of these policies. Then we, we talked about how can we also be positive about this experience and not have it be something that it was purely negative. And so we talked about the uncertainty, which was certainly a reality of the people who were who were uh, involved, but that uncertainty eventually led to hope and empowerment. That it wasn't, in other words, a totally negative experience. That people came away from this with their lives having been changed in any number of ways. 
We talked about the decisions that were made and the consequences of those decisions. And you can you know, fill in the blanks from you know, what we've already seen and you will see. Then we were concerned about family life. We were concerned about the, notion, the, the separation. But then we realized that after the separation eventually came the reconstitution of communities something that very much akin to the idea of empowerment as well. So those two things sort of tied together in our minds. We talked about the relevance of the Constitution. You know, what, are, what are the portions of the Constitution that deal with the issues that concern the internment and relocation? And how do we, how do we demonstrate that? And I'll come to that in a minute. But the Constitution was a very important aspect of this. We also wanted people especially the children, especially the young people who we hope to attract to this memorial. We wanted them to have some idea about the lives of others. We wanted to find ways to have them become an internee in, 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 in many respects. And we discussed a number of ways that you might try to accomplish that. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that we had any, any fixed plan, but we thought that was an important idea that would make this memorial work. Mm -hmm. By the way, then we thought of uh, other kinds of hands-on things for kids to do. We, we, we really were thinking of this as an educational memorial. We were thinking of the, the people who really have no, no, no connection with what happened. You guys are all part of the choir, but you have, to, you have to get out of that mindset and realize that most people in this country are not a part of the choir. So we thought, you know, you, you, can, you can go with this too. Questions and answers, um, very interactive things, heavy emphasis on video because that's what young people are, are really responsive to these days. And we thought that there might be some way to, to give them, as they come to visit the memorial, to give them identities, the identity of an internee. And then one of the other ideas that I, I kind of like is if, if we can find some way to, to have them answer questions in which they are forced to make choices about what they would do under certain circumstances. And if they make the wrong choice, then they get shunted off into a, a group situation where they are the other. They're no longer us. Follow me? Okay. That's it. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. So we wanted to sort of delineate the different groups uh, who were brought here. And the first group was the, the people who were I, I want to say randomly picked up, but I, I guess the FBI would say it differently. Um, <laughs> work from a, a, a list that they had created right after uh, December 7th. The, the prominent uh, Issei uh, leadership of the Japanese American community, uh, which I guess we likened to cutting off the, the head. Now, these were the experienced leaders and they were uh, pretty much uh, all incarcerated. Then the second group came from a, uh, a group mostly out of Thule Lake. Um, and then we had the group who came here as a result of re renouncing uh, their citizenship. So we kicked around ideas of how maybe to resurrect the Fort Lincoln sign. Um, yeah, I threw out the thing about um, guard tower replication uh, as a symbol. Um, and then we kind of got into more um, symbolic uh, concepts of of water and everybody talks about the swimming pool here and so incorporating that notion of water and swimming pool somehow um, and I think Ted's came up with this idea of, of trying to layer different meanings in, into the images um, so haiku poetry um, what else trying to uh, inculcate or include local elements somehow the cottonwood trees um, and then we were thinking about uh, some kind of a museum once they come here and they see this work of art or historical work what is there for 
for students and others to see. And so we're thinking along the lines of maybe recreating a, a museum in one of the buildings. So we actually had two Japanese American uh, uh, groups. And um, so I'll go just quickly through the, uh, the smaller group. Um, so we looked for uh, key words that we wanted to make sure got conveyed. In this group was uh, Bill Nishimura and Hank Naito, who were former internees. Um, the whole issue of uh, uh, the effort to protect the Constitution and to rewrite the narrative that is uh, typically known about what was constitutional. And uh, the point was made that, uh, in fact, those who uh, resisted the uh, unjust imprisonment were, in fact, the, the heroes uh, speaking on behalf and fighting for the, the truth of the Constitution, uh, rather than being labeled as disloyal to it. Um, then we went on to talk about uh, what uh, something that would represent the ideals of the Constitution and the failures. So that uh, I think the other groups have uh, uh, illuminated this idea about uh, the, the horrific outcome when the Constitution is violated and, and ways in which uh, measures were carried out that were in the shadow uh, on the dark side of American history, but also uh, you know, to uh, reprise and clarify what, what are the ideals that we really that American um, people really value and cherish as the ideals represented by the Constitution. So we talked about uh, poetry. We wanted uh, maybe some kind of a statue, monument, a symbol that represented the struggle as a continuing process. Uh, we were talking about, we, we didn't want the uh, monument to say, you know, uh, um, because we received redress or that that w was resolved and now everything is fine, but that the struggle for uh, achieving the, the ideal of uh, American life and principles according to the Constitution is an ongoing struggle. We wanted to make sure that uh, kids who come and, and learn about what happened understand that this is, this is a process. Uh, we wanted a symbol that uh, offered hope that there was uh, uh, the struggle for social justice would be carried on uh, and uh, with the hope of a peaceful future. We wanted, because we were talking specifically, I kept bringing them back to, okay, what does it mean to be a Japanese American? What's the Japanese American part of the story that you want told? And uh, the, the word that came up was the tenacity. What, what would represent the tenacity and the resilience of those people who went through the difficult times. And we thought about the bamboo, which uh, is a great symbol for uh, Japanese culture, but how it bends in the wind and comes back up uh, instead of breaking. Um, also, the idea, the image that could be created in a live garden, possibly, of the bamboo. And uh, this idea of plants growing in a parched land. Uh, came up uh, as a way of demonstrating the two sides of that uh, story. Um, another uh, uh, image from a cultural perspective was the idea of the knot, the integration of the various threads of different people's experiences represented in this unity uh, that's often represented as a knot of silk threads uh, in uh, Japanese symbolism. And then we talked about, you know, what sites, I made them stay really close to the blue yes, sheet so with the instructions because me and yeah. Karen came up with those. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody's got to do it right. Yeah. Somebody else was way creative and that's fine. Uh, so uh, for, uh, for us, the red brick buildings, some preservation, uh, preservation of that seemed like a really important aspect of memorializing Fort Lincoln. And so the first question was the three most important thing. Remember, this is a, like the third rewrite, is for the German-American phenomenon. And hearing this, I understand that it's something that we all share in common, is number one was our freedom was denied, not only physical, psychological, spiritual freedom was denied. Um, 
the term alien kept coming up and I didn't know how to, we didn't know how to describe it, so I just put a label. Um, I'm a special education teacher and once you're labeled autistic, you're considered autistic. Didn't make any difference that Einstein and Bill Gates are autistic, but you are autistic and that has a negative connotation as does in our context the word alien. Also, uh, the German-American exclusion and alienation from the mainstream was an important element, um, being somewhat different than the Japanese-American exclusionary programs. And justice denied, and did we have some trouble with that, didn't we? Justice denied, that's such an overall encompassing word, but we did add that to our list. Yeah, we, we talked about due process, rights of habeas corpus had been removed, um, the um, incarceration uh, without representation or without any of the other elements that go along with due process. Our number two was our image. What image, concrete images, and what I, I have to say also in appreciation of listening to um, the Asian concept of sim symbolism is absolutely amazing. First of all, the, the flag that you described that was in the movie of the various layers and complications involved and all of the deep issues that we see is such an amazing symbol. The symbols of, of the knot and of the bamboo and ours are more concrete. <laughs> the guard tower. <laughs> family photos depicting separation. Um, one was suggested that there would be a family photo and with a, a rift down the middle. The barbed wire, and again, the alien term came up as a word, a term. We were talk, talking about symbols, not only graphic symbols, but actual word symbols. Fear also came up, the element of fear um, the um, paranoia that was caused by a major global conflict that affect us all. Sabrina, can I just say, John, what, your, your yeah. quote yeah. about yeah. the alien. Um, yes, Thanks. Yeah, there are a couple of quotes that I found um, very powerful, and um, if you'll indulge me for just a minute, I'd like to share them with you. Start with Nietzsche. Yeah, Ooh. there's one, um, and again, this is uh, another plug for the dissertation. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's like, give He was on our committee, okay, um, on that, our that's, committee. That, that's right. Um, you know, a dime here, a quarter there, it all adds up. Um, but the first is by uh, Frederick Nietzsche, and he said, what things are called is incomparably more important than what they are. And I, I really like that. It really resonated um, with me because it, I, I think it's true on um, so many levels that once you label a group or something as such, um, oftentimes it tends to become accepted as whatever the label happens to be. Then I thought um, the second um, comes from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 33, 34. Um, and it says this, in terms of universalizing a term, you know, here it is, I, I don't think it can can become much more universal than this. And the quote is, when an alien resides with you in your land, you shall not oppress the alien. The alien who resides with you shall be to you as the citizen among you. You shall love the alien as yourself, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. I'm the Lord your God. Um, that's not, of course, me saying I'm the Lord your God. Um, so, it, it, you know, to, to me, that is just so profound. And then a third quote I have comes from one of my favorite rock groups, uh, Rush, and it's this. Um, so the three are very different, but same idea. Um, things crawl in the darkness that imagination spins. Needles at your nerve ends crawl like spiders on your skin, pounding your temples in a surge of adrenaline. Every muscle tense, defense, the enemy within. Um, and of course, the song not about enemy alien internment, but I thought it um, pretty applicable nonetheless. So, you know, I think we can use quotes like this um, to give people who come in a sense of what happened, you know, from the Bible, from modern um, pop culture, from, from songs to um, intellectuals. Um, I mean, all people, it, these really are universal themes. 
Thank you. Uh -huh. <laughs> now, to our museum on the mall in Washington. Um, we came up with the museum concept. Um, and the basis for that, as I remember, so hop on in, is that, um, that this process, when we talk about a memorial, we think of a static process, something which exists. But the process is, in fact, it's been brought up by all of you, is a dynamic process. So our thought of a museum was something where both could be incorporated at once. And it, there it would contain artifacts, of, would be a research facility for scholars who are interested in cross-cultural internment. In this case, we were talking German-American, but cross-cultural. It would be a repository for artifacts that can be preserved through a preservation. Uh, also, the, um, the archives for transgenerational stories, many of which who we are here today. An on-site building, possibly here on-site, which might be something to be considered. And one of our members, Anita, came up with an architectural contest, that we should have an architectural <laughs> contest and have architect students or architects design something. Um, so the museum concept is both static and dynamic to the same time, and the memorial was considered, the memorial specifically, we considered a wall somewhat like the um, Vietnam Wall in Washington on the Mall that would contain all of the elements of the internment here at Fort Lincoln. Uh, and names, guard tower and the archway that existed previous to the present. But anyway, that was one suggestion as opposed to starting from scratch, that there perhaps the college might be willing to provide us with a, a place for all of this to take place as a starter on our way to the mall. So when you say mall, are you really proposing that you <laughs> Hey, what? Well, look, the Washington you know, I'm memorial. I'm from L. A. Right, from Hollywood, sure. and anything is possible in Hollywood. So the thing is, if the Japanese American community in Los Angeles, I don't know how many of you people have been to the Japanese American Museum in in Los Angeles. It's a hell of a place. Pardon my French. It is absolutely the most fabulous museum to the Japanese American internment. Fabulous. It's an arc. I went there for research. I mean, I sat there for hours doing research. Those folks were so nice. They're available for research. They'll give you information. They'll guide you to the proper websites. I'm, I'm thinking, that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> we, we felt that there were some great parallels here uh, with uh, uh, Native Americans and the Japanese internment, that there were some incredible similarities that we could not deny, no matter what. We would, we would want to raise awareness uh, about what happened here, the historical reasons of how and uh, why, the timelines, the chronologies, because it's very important. Not only are you going to rewrite the narrative <clears throat> in the process, if you include Native Americans, you're going to rewrite the master narrative because Columbus did not discover America. <laughs> we can't get, he was lost. <laughs> Columbus was lost. He didn't even know it. <laughs> so um, we want to promote value of the, the value of what happened here and the importance of understanding and trusting other cultures because that was one of the uh, things that happened to us. You know, the, there was, we didn't have a problem. There was no Indian problem. You know, we, didn't, we were in paradise until the encounter. So um, we want to break the silence of what happened here. Uh, we want to continue or uh, maintain our openness, and we did talk about a memorial. 
Yeah. So I think that we have a copy back there of the memorial. Here it is, right here. We already drew this. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to know that we had landscapers here uh, last week from NDSU who walked around our campus here and did some renovating and ideological renovating. And this was one of them. I selected this one because I think it would really make a beautiful memorial. I'm, oh, I'm still I'm still on the other question because we talked about the visitor center the uh, museum, but we didn't talk about having it in Washington, D.C. We, <laughs> we talked about having it here. We, want, yeah, we, really want <laughs> we talked about having it here in, uh, in at United Tribes as an interpretive center or maybe on site. We want to work on removing the shame because there was a lot of shame connected to it, uh, to what happened here. And there's a ceremony that we have called the wiping of the tears. And we did that the last time you guys were here. Some of you may remember that. It was one of the most touching, um, healing uh, ceremonies that I ever attended. And uh, it was extremely important for all of us in many ways. It seemed that the group was really uh, valued the whole concept of our specific gathering, which I think was monumental in that uh, as a diverse group, we came together and want to make sure that uh, the multicultural stories are told, um, that we don't lose the specific stories that happen for the different groups, and that those are represented in terms of the, their specific history, the removal process, uh, the, the issue of constitution. Uh, legal and human rights, uh, and going beyond just the immediate experience here in the uh, U.S. In some ways, we were all uh, 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 strands of, of threads that came together with our different stories and our different experiences. And as we move through the process first of examining our own thread, our own uh, personal histories and our own uh, ethnic uh, historical uh, perspectives uh, together in our own separate groups and sharing uh, because of what happened here and um, other uh, internment camps uh, during World War II afterwards most people did not want to talk about their experience so um, someone pointed out today how safe it was to begin sharing uh, our stories uh, with each other first. We knew right from the beginning one of the key um, features would be to try to gather former internees, former internee family members, um, scholars, and other folks who were uh, interested in this topic together in a somewhat limited in size planning conference so uh, we could really dig deep into the subjects. So um, Satsuki and I both have contacts. Um, in the Japanese and German American and German Latin American, Japanese Latin American <laughs> communities. And um, we put our heads together and uh, I think we came up with a very representative yes. group. What impacts me about everything on the charts, the thing that bounces out at me is the word blending or the word um, family or the word community. Those words, blending, community, I really feel a kinship with everyone here. And I'm humbled by it, and I'm appreciative of it, and I just want to say again, thank you to everyone. There are so few of us internees uh, left. Um, you know, we're kind of the, most of us, the babies of the camp. Um, it's time for all of us across the ethnicities and across the programs to get together and do this. And I think 
this is such a, a terrific, hopeful start. Uh, the answer to why now, I think, is that's <laughs> cr the critical question. Uh, and I, I say that in the context of my own book, which was published in 1984 and nobody read, because <laughs> nobody cared. But today, since 9-11, in the issue of what we do in this country with those others among us who we perceive as a threat to our national security, we're making many of the same mistakes today that we made 70 years ago. So one of the purposes of this conference is to help to be an educational tool for the government to help refine the system of what we do so that so many people's freedom and due process rights are not stomped on by a fearful <coughs> bureaucracy that's responding to the urgencies of war. Um, I think that the ideas that we've come up with are fantastic. Um, I guess the key now is to take it to the next level and um, that's going to take organization, it's going to take work, it's obviously going to be a grassroots effort and of course it's going to take money and in order to raise money we're going to need to, I think, probably have some sort of organization and, and all of your support. So we want to just uh, keep it rolling because we have such a great start. Uh, it's, I think, important to understand that this is a baby step, a critical one, but a first baby step. The grant cycle period, I'm sure it'll go on for 10 years because the government has allocated $31 million for these various restorations and preservations. <coughs> that means we are part of the first grant cycle. The second grant cycle, we couldn't work fast enough to get an application for that, but the third grant cycle begins when, Wes? No, I'm not sure. First part of March. <laughs> first part of March. We will have an application for a third grant cycle which will be to implement what you folks have so wisely and kindly contributed. And I again would congratulate all the members of the committee for knowing that you folks would be the driving force behind whatever we put together. When we have an installation ceremony of the memorial that comes out of this conference, we're all going to be together again. And oh, do I look forward to that.